Welcome to Enjoy the Journey podcast, where we interview expert entrepreneurs and thought leaders to help guide you in pursuit of financial freedom. Presented to you by Jackson Milan, the Wealth Mentor, where we help service-based business owners remove cash flow bottlenecks, maximize their profits, and turn business profits into personal wealth. G'day guys, Jackson Milan, the Wealth Mentor, and we're here for another episode of the Enjoy the Journey podcast. And I've got a very good friend of mine, uh, Michael Griffiths, the referral marketing guru and the founder of the Partnership Club uh, with us today. Now, uh, Michael and I go way back, uh, well before the beard. Uh, Michael was actually the, the first person to teach me about the concept of strategic partnerships. And I still remember sitting around a round table with Michael of him explaining to me the idea of a, an eagle partnership and a par partnership. And uh, that really changed the, the, my perspective on how to leverage uh, other people's networks and other people's businesses to be able to grow my own. Uh, so I'm super excited to unpack some of his genius today. So for those of you who don't know you, which I'm sure the, the list of people who don't know you these days is probably pretty short, but uh, mate, give us a little bit of a crash course. Who are you and what do you do exactly? Give the quick short story. Uh, primary school teacher by trade, elite level basketball coach, travel the globe, uh, been a couple of Olympics as an assistant coach. That's what I thought life would always be. Uh, 2009, life changed slightly, uh, had a choice of taking up University of Hawaii, head coaching job or coming back home because a family member got really ill and back home we came. So it only took about three months before I got sick of the lazy teachers and went, hey, time to go do something else. So started our first business there. Uh, let's fast forward 11 years, had seven businesses, sold six along the way. And today... Uh, I think through mistake, uh, and we've had this business now for eight years, but it came through just always being great at growing our previous businesses through referrals, through our networks, through word of mouth, through organic ways. And um, since then, that's what we've gone on. And we've brought in a whole bunch of neuroscience and human biology and brain chemicals to show sort of service providers and consultants how to grow a business through referrals, client retention and word of mouth. That's amazing, mate. Fantastic. So let's go back to the, the beginning, because I think this is really interesting in terms of being uh, coaching at that elite level of sport, but then also being really successful in business. And through my experience in entrepreneurship, I've always found like connections between being a really good sports person or a really good sports coach and being really successful in business. So let's go back to those days of getting to elite level coaching. What makes a really good elite level sports coach? Yeah, so I suppose it started off with um, playing and, and the reason for going into coaching is because eventually you get injured, so you can't play anymore. But when I was 10, 11, grew up down in, in Melbourne and Victoria, played five years of state basketball, always playing up in age, five national titles, was playing still probably the young, I think I was still the youngest person at an AFL club Hawthorne to play a senior game when I was 15 and a half. Uh, three knee reconstructions at 17, 18, 19, and that's the end of, of playing. So I looked at so many people who were then playing in the WNBL and going over to college in the US and playing the AFL, and I couldn't do any of that because my knees weren't going to move at all. So I think it starts there around just simply the discipline and the desire of doing something that you really want to do. And I think a lot of people, especially when they go into business, and, and I've been in this spot myself where I've lost that. I, I suppose in essence, it, it's losing your, your why or losing the passion to why are you really doing it? So getting up and going to a basketball court at 5 a.m. was just what you did. Like you loved it. There was no other place that you wanted to be. And therefore, it really didn't feel like work or it really didn't feel hard and it just became part and parcel of what you did. I always sort of look at it, and I've been lucky enough sort of working with the, with the Opals, the Australian women's basketball team, to be down at the Institute of Sport at the AAS and be to a lot of different amazing sporting programs around the world. And swimming's always the one I look at, to how they get up at 3.34 and just look at the boring black line after line after liner. It's just what mental toughness you need to have to be able to do that. And I talk about this quite regularly, just within my own household, to my own little one, who's only eight and a half. You've got to do things that you don't like doing and become good at doing things that are uncomfortable. 
and, and I feel society sort of gives us this pass of, you know, what it doesn't matter. Just catch up on it tomorrow. Or it doesn't matter if you didn't get all that done. Or it doesn't really matter. Like, you're still going to have a roof for your head or you're still going to have food on your table. Like, it's a first world problem. It just doesn't. And when you hear that constantly time after time after time after time, after 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, you just become lazy. And, and if I was to have a look, I would go, the majority of people are just simply lazy. Right? And that's not trying to be hard. It just is what it is. Yeah, there's no skin in the game, I believe. I think uh, there's, there's very little risk of loss, right? Because I think... That's why the, so many entrepreneurs are such inc- have such incredible work ethic because they've come from nothing. They know what having nothing is, so they never want to go back to that. So they use that as the emphasis. And I think this probably comes back to sport too, and I'm sure you've seen it. Talent very rarely gets you to the top. Uh, talent opens the door, but it's that sheer determination and perseverance that gets you the results. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen some amazingly talented people come through, the, come, come across and step onto the court in basketball. But is it often the most talented people that are the most successful or is it the ones that are just sheer determined? Yeah, it's all about hunger. It's, it's all about... Uh, there's, there's so many times where you'd see someone on, on so many different fields step across that line and just be completely relent- like relentless. There was no possible way that they weren't going to win. And, and in essence, uh, I was like that, in that step over on, step onto a field and it was just like, I don't care who you are. I, I'm not losing. Uh, it's, it's as simple as that. And they come off the field completely different. I'm actually going back right now. It's funny, going back and reading Todd Herman's book, The Alter Ego. And it's just so true that, to have, I had this alter ego of when I stepped on the field or stepped on the court versus when I was off it because there was just no possible way. Like I would do whatever it took to win. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, and, and I think we don't quite sometimes as, as entrepreneurs quite go to that extent where it's like, you know what, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll miss out on going away this weekend. I'll miss out on that party. I'll go and have a great time and and not drink because I need to be absolutely at my 2,000% best the next day. We give ourselves little outs and that's the difference to just completely being relentless versus it's okay. And look, and it's an interesting phenomena, isn't it? Because I found myself in this position too, in both business and sport. Um, I've been a martial artist for most of my life, very, very harsh on the body because I've done full contact martial arts and jujitsu for a decade and knees are shot, necks shot. I start, I'm, I'm only 32 and getting out of bed in the morning uh, to start to get a little bit sore. But I found myself that if I didn't have a milestone that I was working towards, it was so easy to come up with excuses. But if I had a competition coming up, or I had something that I needed to get prepared for, that you could rally behind that and use that as the, the thing to, to diffuse all of those little voices in your head that try and get you off the hook. And the same thing happens in business. I see business owners who start with dreams of grandeur and then very quickly become jaded and become a shadow of the former selves and just accept the mediocrity of whatever their business is serving up for them. Like, oh, it's okay if I pay myself below average wage. It's okay if I work 80 hours a week. And it's crazy that we have these alter egos in business too. So how have you been able to translate your amazing work ethic on the field and as a coach into business? There was early on, so early on without a doubt, um, the drive and desire to be able to have a completely different life than one of turning up and, and teaching was was the driver, without a doubt. And we went through, like we had, we've had amazing businesses that got created and sold without really, I go, it wasn't without work, but it wasn't what it was built for. Like the tutoring business, we found a great partnership and all of a sudden we picked up 420 new families within three weeks. The marketing agency, we picked up, we did a great, uh, webinar with Amex and all of a sudden we had four and a half thousand clients within literally three months. Like we've, we've had some great things that have taken place that then other people have come along and said, oh, can I have that? And it hasn't been my passion. So I've quite happily gone, yeah, yeah, I'll just go on to the next thing type of thing. Without a doubt, I lost it. And when I look through 2000 and 
probably 15, 16, 17, 18, I very easily just slipped into, hey, we do a good job. And, and the, the burning desire within wasn't there. It didn't mean that we didn't have a great business and things were, but compared to before, where it was, that wasn't there. So it was funny that I can now talk about this because I've come back full circle and in particular this particular year and, and doing a program of 75 hard and becoming mentally tough again and then getting in and, and getting around people like Tim Grover and Todd Herman who are all around mental toughness and, and just being relentless and just getting back into that way of things. Uh, David Goggins and doing his 4 by 4 by 48 challenge and he's I'm someone who's... They're lucky if they can run five kilometres ever, let alone running four miles, 6.5 kilometres every four hours for 48 hours straight type of thing. And again, that's what brought me back to you've got 77 kilometres to run 48 miles in a weekend. There was just no way I wasn't going to do it. It was as simple as that. Um, we did it for Make-A-Wish Foundation and raised nearly $50,000. And, and I still remember I started Friday 3 p.m. and it was a Saturday and you, you've hardly slept. And it was Saturday, 7 p.m. I didn't want to do that. I felt like absolute crap. But then I also remembered and it, it hit me. It was like two minutes before I was supposed to start. And I was just questioning. I went, how can you be so selfish when you think about so many of those kids that you're running for and supporting what they go through every single day? That moment right there that completely changed and has just now completely changed going forward to it's bigger than you now. You have to make it bigger than you. And when you make it bigger than you, sorry, it doesn't matter anymore. You ain't going back. You, there is no excuse good enough anymore. And I think that's been a huge lesson in the last six months to get to this level, which I don't think I've probably ever been at ever before in terms of just winning. This makes a lot of sense to me, mate. And I think this is the reason why high performance teams succeed because they make it not about them. It's about the team. Like if they're not pulling their weight, they're letting the team down. And for myself personally, I really struggled for a really long time of being a dreamer and never really following through with what I said. I was a bullshit artist. And when I started to understand my own programming in my mind of how I operated, and I realized I had a, a deep sense of accountability to others. And if I made things vocal, if I, I shared things out in the open, if I told people publicly that I was going to do something, I never wanted to be perceived as a liar and I never wanted to let them down. So I, I made something bigger than myself. So then I'd keep myself on the hook. So I'm really motivated to do something. If I want to put my balls on the line, I always tell my network about it. I tell my family about it. I tell my friends, my colleagues about it. And I always follow through now. And it seems like that's what you've discovered for yourself, that deeper purpose to something that's bigger than you that gets you out of the way of your own bullshit, right? Day by day by day by day, we get chipped away and just a little bit of our belief, of our confidence, of our, I call it our, our air of good arrogance, our swagger. It just slowly just eats away and chips away with everything that's happening within life. And... And it's that that we've got to get back. And when we get that back, then it, it is like stepping onto a court or stepping into an arena or stepping into, it's your stage, it's your field. And no matter what you're in in business, that's your field. Beautiful. I love that. It's fantastic. But it's an interesting mindset. And I think what this is interesting as well is that people have a lot of mindsets and assumptions around growing your business through referrals. And you really shifted my mindset on this many years ago, that for a long time, we see so many business owners relying on word of mouth and relying on referrals. But the belief for most businesses is that it's something that's outside of their control. Their ability to grow their business is directly reliant on external people talking about them in order for them to grow. And that could be a tremendous risk. However, you've created a system that has allowed hundreds of businesses, myself included, to grow and scale using referral partnerships and word of mouth marketing. So what's the mindset that people need to change to get them to use these mechanisms that are often outside of their control to actually control them and use them to predictably grow? For most 
people in business, and especially service providers, we know that business is all about relationships. It's as simple as that. Uh, as long as we're dealing with humans, humans will always do things with other humans that they resonate with, therefore they can respect, and therefore they can be inspired by. It's how we are hardwired. So we, we come from tribes, we come from primal instincts, which are in every single human. So it's actually, let's take away growing a business through referrals. And no matter what you want to grow a business in, there's a couple of key things. You need to create profound loyalty in others. You need to create overwhelming trust in others. You need to create deep bonds with others. And when you start to do those sorts of things, no matter how you want to grow a business, that's when people can start to go, I resonate with you, therefore I can respect you, therefore you inspire me. And whether that's a prospect coming and buying from you or whether that's someone in your networks then opening doors or sharing you or connecting you to other people or whether that's a referral source now wanting to give you more referrals, it really comes down to some simple, pretty human primal instincts of I do things with people who I trust, who I resonate with, who I feel I have a bond with. And that's why, in essence, we talk about all the time, it's about creating brain chemicals in people. It's about the good old dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin. And the more you actually do that, you're in complete control. And the scary part is we actually have more control over other humans than what we actually realise when we actually start to understand how our brains work. It's really interesting. People don't normally go here, mate. And I think a lot of people think this can sometimes be a little bit woo-woo, but it's science, right? Like once we understand the science behind it, then we can understand the strategies and the tactics. But so many people jump straight to the tactics when it comes to this stuff. Why do you think that is, mate? It's sort of in that instant gratification, I need something yesterday type of world we live in. You pick up your phone now and you jump onto Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and you've got at least the next 20 people saying, do this, here's my favourite script, here's my favourite tool, here's my piece of technology, here's my thing that'll get you what you wanted three days ago. No, it's as simple as that. Like, it, it just, I can give whatever script you want. Won't work because in the end, you're tapping into the wrong part of the brain. You're tapping into the logical, analytical cortex side of the brain where we've got to be in the limbic side of the brain, which controls all human behavior and is only based on feel. So you sort of just go, you're listening to this right now and you're going, he's a moron or wow, this is absolutely amazing. Or however you rationalize it, you rationalize it. But you rationalize it through the initial feeling that you got by what's going on when you're listening to it. And that's how we operate as humans. So you'll say, I don't know why I really like them or I don't know why I wanted to work with them or I don't know why this was the business for me. And you can't know, it's a feeling. But that's what happens over and over and over and over again, every single day. And we actually have it with our partners, whether you're married or got a girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, life partner, it's the same thing. Most of the time, I can ask, so what do you really like your wife, your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your life partner? And it's 100% right. You don't really know. You'll come on, you'll rationalize and go, oh, they've got amazing hair. They've got this great beard. They're so kind. They're so loving. And that's great. That's in the cortex side that rationalizes it to justify your feeling. But in the feeling, you can't know. So imagine that, that you can actually influence how someone feels by how we do things. I, yeah, but that, that takes, I suppose, a little bit more time and it takes then having to, to change how we are as a person to be something a little bit different to probably what we're used to. Yeah, and we, we cracked this code probably by mistake, to be honest, is that we saw that how every, all of our competitors and all the other people in the marketplace were showing up and it's so corporate and clinical and it all looks the same. It all feels the same. It all reads the same. It has no real emotive connection. It's so logical. And when we threw our hands up and said, fuck this, we're just going to be ourselves and we're going to share ourselves and who we are and, and what makes us tick as people and our values and then the things that we hold dear and the things that we don't like. And as a result of doing that, we're going to build deep and meaningful relationships with people that are just going to reach out and say, guys, I have absolutely no idea what you do, but I just 
want it. And that, that's the that's the ultimate aim, right? Yeah, because they resonate with you. Like oh, you think about if if people follow you on your socials, which they should, they've come on your journey for the last couple of months. Have you been up there in North Queensland and buying a property and playing with frogs and uh, been getting all your farm animals and your goats? And I, it's like I either resonate with what you're doing and how you're doing it, and you, you're talking the talk and walking the walk, and and being able to use your business to be able to create further wealth and live life on your terms. Or you don't, and you go, what's he doing buying goats when he should be doing? Doesn't matter. Neither's right or wrong. You either resonate with me or you don't resonate with me. And that's always the starting point. So again, we try to please everybody, which means we're going to end up pleasing nobody, where in the end, it's been more true to ourselves and just saying, hey, how do I be who I need to be? because then people will actually want to be around me, who they'll want to help. They'll talk about me. They'll share things for me because of the type of person that I am. And that's where it starts. And that's so important. So Vada, I speak to a lot of business owners and they're typically in one or two camps. We're going to talk about the frustrated camp for a moment here, where they go to networking groups. They've tried to create referral partnerships and they're just so frustrated because these people just aren't actively referring opportunities into their business either they're not referring at all or they're referring the wrong types of people what would be your top three tips on top of what we've spoken about in terms of getting people in the in the right fields of making that kind of emotional connection but what are your top three tips to get people setting their referral relationships on fire and getting them actually producing real and tangible value so without a doubt let's just start off here some people are just duds it's just, it's just that simple and you're going to come across duds and you just gotta go, okay, I just had a dud and off I go. So I think the first thing around that is you gotta create some rules to, to know whether it's your sort of person or not. So I always have my five ticks. And my five ticks start with, do they have the same sort of mindset as me? Do we have the same values as each other? Do we have the same sort of networks? I actually ask myself, is this a person who I want to help? Do I think it's gonna be fun? And if I can get those five ticks, I'm now ready to at least explore the next part of, hey, let's just do something for each other and we'll see how it goes. So without any rules, you sort of get to a point of, I won't go, it's desperation, but like you're not the prize. And, and therefore you try anybody and everybody who says, oh yeah, I'll do something with you, makes you excited. And that's why you end up with more duds than what you should end up with. So Know your five ticks would be the first thing. Uh, the second one would be, you've got to be great at creating action plans. Like every time you and I speak, we leave speaking with, okay, I'll do this, this, this for you. And you go, I'll do this, this, this for you. And we just, we action it straight away. If you're not creating action plans, you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs, hoping that something's going to happen. And that is what most people do. Like to me, there's this myth. It takes time to build relationships. Rubbish. I can build a relationship literally within seconds if I wanted to. Because it's the moments that people remember when you make them feel a particular way. So break your business, break the event, break your networking group, break down everything into moments. So to me, if you need that, if you had your five ticks, if you're great at creating action plans where it's just simply, hey, let's just find one way to be able to help each other. And if you just did that over and 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 over again, then you're always going to have great stuff happening. And think about your moments. And as basically in essence, we, we have our thing that we, we say activating extraordinary moments throughout a business. Think about your moments and how you could be more extraordinary within your moments because it's those things which then will build trust, bond, connection, and they're all the, the magic pillars that help you to have better uh, relationships with people and therefore people want to help you. I love that. I think you hit the nail on the head with this, mate. And this was a big misconception that took me a long time to, to shift myself is that it takes time to build relationships. And if you, if you have that belief, of course, you're not going to get any quick wins from these relationships because you're investing all of this time and you're not, and you haven't even worked out whether they're a dud or not, or you're, you're kicking, you're basically trying to push shit up a hill. And 
we've been able to create like multi-million dollar partnerships with a 15 minute conversation. 15 minutes that you can establish that initial rapport, tick those, those five non-negotiables. We know we align from values. We've got similar client bases. We can help each other. And, and even if it is that Eagle partnership where there's one that's bigger than the other, that's fine. As long as there's a, some reciprocal value exchange where everyone wins and you can make, get results lightning fast, which is, uh, which is awesome. Everyone has their own driver. It doesn't matter how big someone is and how small someone is. I go uh, with our marketing agency and we got to run a webinar for, for Amex business cards holders in Oceania. I had two clients at the time. Why let me do it when they've got hundreds of thousands of card holders? It's got nothing to do with size. It has everything to do with the moment you made someone feel a particular way where they've gone, ha, huh, I'll give them a go because I like them. And that's it. Beautiful. I love that. Fantastic. So let's do a bit of a segue here, mate. Obviously, you've successfully exited out a number of businesses. And business exits are great for building wealth. And I know that you prioritize wealth creation as part of one of the, the main mantras of why you're in business. So when it comes to defining financial freedom, what does financial freedom mean to you? To be able to do what I want, when I want, how I want, is probably how I'd sum it up. Um, there's, it's not a number. It's not a. It, it's just simply that I can do what I want, when I want, how I want, with who I want. That's that would be how I define it. I love that. Fantastic, mate. And are you the type of entrepreneur that ever sees yourself hanging up your boots and retiring completely, or do you always see yourself doing something that you're passionate about to keep your tool sharp? To me, it's a game. Like all of this is a game, and. So why finish the game until the game's actually over? And um, it's, I sort of go, why, why in the game early if the game hasn't actually stopped? So life's obviously the game. Let's keep playing the game within it to go, how do we keep on doing little things and, and winning? And our, our wealth has come to more than just simply, like to begin with, it's about, what can, what can we create? What can I create? What can you create? Where now it's it's what can be created for the impact that it will make on others. So I think there's a, a transition eventually that that happens and shifts when you get to a point where you just go, well, I don't need anything else, and and Soph doesn't need anything else. Um, but how can we help? In uh, and we've got things around building schools, and we've got things around seriously all children and education, and underprivileged children and education, and technology into remote communities and underprivileged, uh, sorry, rescued animals and, and food and shelters. And, and there are things that, to me, underprivileged children or children and animals are the two that really don't have a voice. So we get to help be part of their voice. So now the game isn't just so much around how do you create wealth just for yourself, but how do you create wealth to impact and, and help change society? And I think that's our, our, our duty, right? And this is how coming back to what we spoke about before of creating a purpose that's something that's bigger than you is that we go through these five stages of financial well-being where most business owners start at what we call financial battle where they're, they're, they're traded in their corporate income and they're basically spending more than they're making they're, they're burning through their cash whilst they get their business to an economy of scale then they get to comfort where they kind of break even they live comfortably but there's nothing really left over then they get to growth where they've got surplus and they start using that surplus to compound and build. Then we get to freedom where we've got the ability to do what we want, when we want and how we want it. And then we get to abundance where we have the ability to impact others because we've got freedom for ourselves. And I think that's really where all business owners should, should target to be. In your experience, mate, what do you think gets in the way? Because that's not the reality for most business owners. Most business owners have created a job for themselves. They're struggling to break even. What do you think stops people from making that, that transition into freedom or abundance? So it's always ourselves, um, but let's, let's get a bit deeper into, into that. It's actually, it's actually our hard wiring. So our hard wiring is there for survival. It's why we will, how our brain was created. You go back to caveman days, it was to make sure the saber two tigers and the wild animals didn't eat us. We don't have those problems anymore, but our brain hasn't 
changed a great deal. It's still around survival. How do I make sure that I'm going to be okay? That little voice that we hear, which is which is fear, go, oh, don't, oh, that's a bit risky. Oh, should I get out of those shares now? Maybe the media is talking about there's going to be a big crash and there's going to be a big correction and well, oh, what? There's just so much out there which can easily derail us doing anything. And I, I think when you know that it's like, okay, I have this brain that's been created for me, but the brain is there as hardwired just to help me survive. So therefore, I've got to make sure that I'm doing other things that actually take me from survival mode into thrive mode. And that's not always easy. Uh, and I think it's probably even harder today than probably even when it was for, for say, my parents because there's just so much more media and you can stream everything off a phone and uh, it's just constant bombardment 24-7 where at least if you didn't put on the, the, the 6 o'clock news, you probably wouldn't even know half the stuff that was going on in the world back then. So you didn't have all this internal conflict within you. Um, so when I look at the sorts of things and my morning routines are fairly, well, it's, it's they're always the same seven days a week in terms of waking up, meditation, uh, listening to my own recorded thoughts and affirmations, journaling, reading, getting out and running. But it's about how do you prime yourself in morning? How do you take time sometime throughout the day to reprime? And then what do you do of an evening to make sure, again, you are just conditioning yourself, in essence, to, to win nonstop? And, and I go, that's the big thing. It, it's not a, sure, that there, are, there are strategies and there are tactics and there are good things to do and bad things to do and there's rules to follow and all the rest of it. And you need someone who's on your team to be able to help that. And having people on your team is, a, is an absolute must. But you've got to get yourself out of the way to be able to let then the great people on your team do actually what they're great at doing. And that's probably the thing that I see people not do is they get themselves through their own. And again, it's not their fault. It's how we're hardwired. But we're, you've got to bust through that to allow then people on your team to be able to help you. And if I look at we first went into property and we just went straight to, to an education group. And within a year, we had five properties. I wouldn't have done that by myself. I wouldn't have known how to do it by myself. And you've got to believe, and I suppose that's, again, the, the type of person I think we've got to become where there are people who know what they know, which you don't. And therefore, you've got to believe them. It's like if there's some smarter people than you, and there's a lot of more smarter people than me who say, we've just been spending the last so many years researching this, and this is what has been proven, well, I don't come along and go, oh, no, I'm just going to stay back here and I don't believe you. And I mean, it's just stupid. And yeah. it's the same within why people get themselves stuck. It's because they try to take too much on. They're in their own way and they don't get to go from survival um, thinking to thriving thinking that allows them then to get good people on their team. The way I look at it is, so many people are chasing these strategies and tactics. It doesn't matter if it's business or whether it's referral partnerships or whether it's wealth. And there comes a point in time where you need to upgrade the operating system because I think so many people out there just accept their mindset and their way of doing things for what they are. But the biggest shift that I've ever made in my life is realizing that those things are not set in stone, that I actually have the ability to play architect with my own internal operating system and change the things that don't serve me and improve the things that do and rewrite the way that I play the game. And it's like exiting the matrix, right? And when you're stuck in that, that operating system and you're in this ignorant bliss, and it's only when you can get out of the matrix and realize that everything was just actually wasn't real and, and that what you were doing wasn't working for you that you can then start changing that trajectory. So I think that's so important, mate. And it was a critical skill and an epiphany moment that I created. So Michael, I guess for you, mate, being a successful entrepreneur, having multiple exits, obviously you've done some, some great things in terms of wealth. What do you think has been your single proudest wealth decision that you've made? I think it's probably just the the, the love of the game now. 
I look at so many of our properties, never seen. In fact, I don't even know the suburb or what's even around the suburb. It doesn't matter because it all was just numbers worked and, and away we went. And it had a really clear plan of a couple of years to then pull out equity to be able to do things again. And uh, I, I think it's just learning all of that, like coming from being a school teacher, and which is absolutely nothing wrong with being a school teacher, but hey, you turned up and you taught kids to, to really now sort of being under, to understand that, hey, what's happening right now in, in China as an example, and the supply chain being disrupted, what that's going to do to various shares. And what's that going to do to people over Christmas time? And now you sort of have a bit of an idea of what certain stocks will do. And it, like it, it's all fascinating that it's logic. And, and when you understand that, okay, because of this has happened, there will be a flow on effect, which will cause this to happen. And therefore, you can actually go in and profit on that because you actually just understand how the world works. So I reckon that would be it. It's just it's just taking the time to really learn from great people who are much smarter than me, who really sort of can shed light on that. So I'm always curious. And that's probably the big thing. Just just staying curious to to me, there's nothing. I remember it was a time where someone talked to me about, you know, so you can actually own your own ATMs. I mean, what do you mean the bank owned the ATMs? I mean, no, you can actually, the ATMs in petrol stations and in some of these convenience stores where they charge their $2.50 and you actually put the ATM in there and own it. And every time someone pays their $2.50, you get $2 on it. Like, what? That sounds pretty good. Um, and it's like things like that, which for most people, A, they'd be closed off or B, we'd go, oh, that doesn't sound right or that sounds too good to be true. And therefore, they would stop being curious to actually go and find out about those things. So, yeah, we have like 15 ATMs that we own around the country. And um, it's sort of like, you know, how good that? Go take out your money and we'll take your $2 out of your $2.50. And um, thanks very much for using our ATM. But it's a curiosity. Don't stop being curious. Yeah, you have to be, mate. And I think this is the biggest problem but so many people, particularly entrepreneurs, abdicate responsibility in these areas, which is the polar opposite of curiosity. Um, you can't just say, ah, oh, I don't want to know that. I don't have time for that. I'm just going to abdicate that responsibility to somebody else. You need to be curious. and You need to have a, some level of understanding of these things. And sure, you can outsource a lot of the heavy lifting, but only once you have a, an, a fundamental understanding of what it, what it is that you're doing. I think that's critically important. So in contrast, Michael, in terms of looking back on your journey, particularly your wealth journey, with what you know now, if you had your time over, is there anything that you would have done differently when it comes to your wealth? If you gave me fearful and live life like that, life's not going to be much fun uh, and, and there's a thing i'll just sort of read it off off my phone it sits on my notes it's something which i read every single day to start flowers may bloom again but a person never has a chance to be young again and it comes off the abc kids show bluey and i remember listening to it it just hit me i was listening watching the show once with, with Soph, my little one and it was out of the fortune cookie that, that one of the kids read. And the dad had just finished saying, no, you can't go under the tap. That's what was in the fortune cookie. So, of course, they got to go under the tap and, and get all wet. But it's so true. Flowers may bloom again, but a person never has a chance to be young again. And so when you take that in context, it's like play the game. Play the game to win. Play the game to, to dominate. Play the game to make impact. And just don't be fearful. Beautiful advice, mate. This has been fantastic. This has been super packed with value, uh, which I, I didn't expect anything less. So, Michael, if someone's listened to this episode or watched this episode and they really resonate with what you've uh, what you've said, how are they best to get in touch with you, mate? Yeah, if you just pop onto uh, michaelgriffiths.com.au, that's the best place. Uh, whatever your favourite social platform is, you'll find us from that site. Uh, some good resources, some, some helpful videos in terms of transforming client retention and referrals, word of mouth opportunities. So that's the, the best place to go and have a bit of a stalk.
Fantastic, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, mate. Looking forward to catching up again soon. And guys, this has been another episode of the Enjoy the Journey podcast. Uh, make sure that you follow the links in the show notes and looking forward to catching you next time.